Uh, well, I appreciate all of your indulgence on such short notice. Uh, if I seem delirious, it's probably because I am. Um, it's been a wild ride, uh, this transfer window, um, and I got to update Jackson, I feel like once a week and, and every week it was something different and uh, it was a sprint here at the end. Um, but we, we uh, got uh, a target that we're really excited about. Um, you know, and, and I, what I would say is we're in the great game now and we're on the path to player development and there's no turning back. Uh, and we're going to see if we can go find the wizard. So uh, by signing Leo Chu, um, you know, we really add to our stable of, of young players. Uh, we look at him as an attacking new, um, somebody who is uh, athletic, fast, uh, electric, aggressive, um, you know, but a young player and, and a player that's going to need some nurturing and some mentoring. And uh, one of the things we really liked about the, uh, pairing was that that JP is here. And JP is from the same state in Brazil uh, that Leo Chu is from. They don't know each other, um, but the first person that Leo Chu called to, to learn about the Sounders when he heard of our interest was was JP. So, uh, and as you guys know, JP was captain of Botafogo, uh, and we think he's going to be a great mentor uh, to Leo Chu in particular. So, um, Robbie was teasing me uh, before I got on that this is the first winger we've ever signed in eight years since Jordan Morris accidentally became a winger. Um, and I reminded him that we still don't play with any wingers. Uh, but, <clears throat> hey, uh, now we could if we wanted to. So that, that, that's exciting. Um, we look at Leo Chu as a signing. Um, you know, look, he's, we're going to bring him in uh, this year. Uh, realistically, with visa issues, you're probably looking at September 11 before he could debut. Um, so that'll be, a, it'll be a little bit, um, you know, and we'll be ramping them up in the midst of, uh, playing a game every four or five days. It'll be difficult to train in that stretch. And, uh, and so it is, uh, very much a long-term signing for us. Um, and while we, while we did that, we wanted to have some balance and we wanted to add another veteran who could help right away. Um, and, and Nico Benazé, that's, that's what led us to the, the acquisition from within the league. Uh, because he can be available uh, sooner than later, probably um, a week or so from now. Um, so uh, that was exciting. Uh, Nico played against us in the 2019 final, um, and he had a good impression of Seattle fans. So uh, whoever was uh, yelling things to him from the stands, he, was, he must not have understood uh, since he's, he's uh, French. Um, but uh, his English is actually perfect, by the way. Uh, anyway, he's a good veteran ad and, and he's coming here for the stretch run. And, um, you know, we're really excited to add him and a player of his pedigree who was formerly a starter in the French first division. So, uh, and uh, obviously been a, a good player in MLS as well. So um, got some things done and we feel like we have a really good team and I'll repeat the line I've been boring Jackson with for weeks now, which is um, we're going to have the best transfer window of any team in MLS but less to do with signing these two guys and more to do with the five guys that are coming back. So it just started with Nico last night. Hopefully we can still get Nuhu back. We get Fry back down the stretch. Um, uh, who knows? Maybe even see Jordan in the playoffs or something like that. But, um, you know, getting healthy, getting back up to speed. Um, we're really, really excited about our team. Um, I know we've been in a little bit of a lull, but uh, if anything, the lull came later than we thought it might. Um, you know, I think things kind of evened out if we looked at the, the body of work as a whole. Um, we're really excited about the players in the group, um, the veterans that comprise the middle, middle of our roster, the Madrandas, the Rose, the Monteros, the Shane O'Neills. Those guys have been uh, very, very good as well. Um, and now we need to get the big dogs back. And we've added a couple pieces and hopefully it's the right, uh, it's the right recipe to, to try to take a run at win another championship. All right, guys, uh, as always, we'll keep this relatively informal. Uh, no need for, for me or anyone else from the staff to call on you. Just go ahead and fire your questions away. Hey, Garth, we spent so much time talking about positional flexibility when you're looking at this U22 initiative uh, and specifically for this window right here. So when you're looking at the qualities of, uh, of, of a Leo, where did that flexibility of being able to play not only on the wing, but other spots rank in, in terms of that importance of, of, of keying on him as opposed to another player? Um, it was, it was important to us for sure, Jackson. Um, you know, one of the things that we kicked around is 
Um, if you get the mix of players right, can you flip in between a four-two-three-one and a, a three-four-two-one uh, or some version? I think and those 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 decisions will be made by the coaches. Um, they are the tacticians, um, but we just wanted to give them some options. And I do think that a player can play a couple of spots because Benazé can play a couple of spots too. Um, you know, he can play centrally in the in the box formation or in the diamond, depending on how the coaches set it up. He can obviously also play out wide as a winger, so we like that. Um, Leo Chu, I think, is more of a winger wide type, um, you know, but again, uh, it allows us even within game to change our look a little bit and have, have a player bring on a player um, who's very fast. The one quality that we really didn't have in the group uh, without Jordan this year was speed. And it was really important to us to add a pacey winger. Um, and we, we believe we've done that. Obviously, Brad's a fast player and, and knew who is, and, you know, we're not without speed, but in terms of in that attacking third, we just wanted to get more attacking options. Um, to be able to give teams uh, a, a couple different looks because we, we think we've we've gotten I wouldn't say we've gotten stagnant but I think we, we've you know we've been figured out a little bit and, and again I think a lot of that is just we've been still missing a lot of really good players and when we get those really good players back then we can do some more creative things but um, coach Spencer said something to me the other day that was that was interesting he, we feel like <clears throat> we know less about this team than any other team we've had mid, midway through a season for the simple reason that, uh, you know, we had two guys that finished top five in the MVP voting last year, Morris and Ladero. They've played a combined less than 30 minutes in the first half of the season. So, um, you know, it's just the team is radically different. Um, but with Nico coming back in particular, I just think that's going to be a game changer. We'd love to get Nuhu back, especially in this three back system. He's just dynamite. Um, and, uh, you know, just wanted to say, too, that uh, uh, this was not your question, Jackson, but. Uh, congrats to our six all-stars that that's really cool I mean I, I think second most all time but you think that in a normal Sounders lineup we're fielding nine all-stars because you throw Ladero, Morris and Fry in there I mean that's that's pretty sick um, and you're gonna have to work pretty hard uh, to, to upgrade that starting lineup and you know and, and so these guys that we brought in you know they're gonna have they're gonna be competing for spots and for time and um, hopefully we'll have a pretty good team if we can get everybody on the field and you mentioned going back to the way out you, how he talked to Joao Paulo right when he knew that there was interest. Uh, what were you, do you know about that conversation that those two had um, and, and what did kind of, what allowed that, that to kind of flourish and allowed him to be like, yes, yeah, Seattle is a place I would love to go because of JP. You know, look, Jess, I think it's more to do. And I wasn't on the phone. So, so let me just state that and I'll let JP probably go into more detail if he chooses to. Um, but what I would say is, is this is a, this is a, Leo Chu's a, a younger kid. Uh, you know, he's early twenties. Um, he's not traveled a lot outside of Brazil. And I think that's worth keeping in mind. I mean, you know, the, one of the analysis comes to mind is, is he's kind of an attacking new. Um, if you remember just how genuine and how, uh, you know, new had an innocence about him when we first signed him, you know, that it was, it was one of his first times leaving, uh, West Africa. And I, I think there's a similar vibe with, with Leo Chu. Um, uh, again, uh, another just dynamic, fast player, um, who's pretty young, um, but he's had, he's had one good season. Um, he hasn't played a ton this year, but that's why he was the price he was. And so we thought it was a good value. Um, and had that fact that he can play that one good season, um, gives us some confidence that he can uh, come and replicate it nonetheless. Hey, Garth, you kind of touched on a little, a little bit. I wanted to bring up that point that, uh, Leo hasn't played a lot uh, for Gremio. Uh, however, uh, obviously he was loaned and, and all that. Uh, but this is your first uh, U22 initiative guy. I mean, you've always been the type that always brings a guy that, uh, you know, it's upper 25s, proven, ready to come and produce. How do you handle this one a little bit different to make sure that, you know, the expectation and that pressure is not a lot and you can imagine him, manage him the right way to develop and grow into this team. Give me one second here. Just turning on the light there, Nico. Uh, nothing, not offended by your question. Uh, the, it's a really good question, man. We've, we've, because look, that's how we've used the DP rule, right? I mean, we literally have three full DPs and they're all 30 years old, right? JP, Nico, and, and uh, Raul. Um, so, but what, what's what's evolved for us, I think, um, and I think the Austin game is the best example of it, you know, was that was that was a breakthrough, right? I mean, to start five teenagers 
we've been we've been working on this for years. We've been talking about it, pushing these kids, getting them ready, being able to ride bumpy parts of the schedule uh, with young talent. So I, I do think that we've kind of we've cracked the seal on that. We've paved the way. I mean, I think if you talk to the coaching staff guys like Josh and and Danny in particular, Eb Sissoko, you know, I think those are really three players that they kind of look at just now as normal players. Um, and, and they're not, there is no, they're, they're just a young player anymore. So um, I think with that in mind, I think it allows us to evolve in this direction. And, um, you know, look, the, the, the league makes these rules, right? And with three full DPs, we are only allowed one of these under 22 uh, DP slots. YPS is young money. I've heard somebody, somebody's got to like decide on what we're calling these guys because there's, I get confused with the acronyms. Um, but if, if, you know, this is the only young money guy we're going to have, I mean, by definition, it's, this is not Ladero and it's not Rui Diaz and it's not a guy you're banking on turning around your season. It's a guy that you hope can come in and grow and develop and you're given to the coaching staff and, and saying, let's, let's try to find these kids, uh, best qualities and let's wrap them in with, with, uh, Ethan Doubler, you know, the, the, you know, and every, anybody else, Alex Villanueva on the other side, you know, the, the wide players we have in the system already. Uh, and look, you know, we think obviously we, we paid a bunch of money for this kid. We paid two and a half million dollars for him. So, um, that's a significant investment. Um, and that's, uh, a valuation that's, you know, going to cause us to, to hopefully, uh, invest in him and, and, uh, try to make him better. And, and we believe he has the talent to do it. Garth, um, I know you kind of alluded to this, but what, what was the timeline in terms of this coming together? It, you know, from the outside, it looks like it kind of came together overnight. I, I can't imagine it was anything like that. Um, what can you kind of just tell us about, you know, all that went into to making this signing happen? Um, look, and I, I, again, I think I've at least alluded to this on, on uh, KJR, but um, we started out, Jeremiah, thinking about taking some big swings. Um, and we almost... When we first looked at this, we said, hey, you know, could we make this a DP, like a fourth DP, so to speak? Like, could we find someone who's 22 and a half and like is immediately ready to jump in and take us to the next level? And then we, we, we stepped back and, and looked at it and we said, well, look, the, the problem is we're not even sure how we're going to play once Nico gets back in the team. And then beyond that, we're not sure how we're going to play when Nico and Jordan get both back, get back in the team, you know? If you're going to play with Jordan Morris at left wing, you're probably going to have to move to a four back system. So, you know, that then impacts the center backs, which impacts the holding midfielders. So, uh, you know, as I've, I've talked about different forms, it, it, it's a, it was a really complex issue. And so what we thought was the, the asset we could get that would work in any system is a young, fast player, because it gives us that thing that we don't have right now. Um, that would, and it's system flexible. Um, he, he can thrive in, in either system. There's a role for him, uh, either way. Uh, and so, uh, to specifically the timeline, Jeremiah, you know, we were working on a couple different things, uh, and then, uh, it became clear to us toward the end of the window that this was the right fit. And, and that's part of the process, right? This is a new rule. So I would say that our thinking evolved over the course of the window, um, but this really felt like the right investment to make. We had consensus on it across everybody internally. Um, and, you know, uh, Craig Weibel was leading our team, Robbie Romanini, Sean Henderson. Um, and I think everybody felt good uh, under Weibel's leadership that, uh, that this was the right guy to go get. That's kind of uh, going on that then. There was, like you had mentioned earlier, there was a uh, thought that your bigger signings would be the injured players, um, you know, coming back. So, but it, it, you weren't really banking on that kind of thing. I mean, you always wanted to make a, a move um, during this window. Yeah, I mean, wanted to, yeah. I, I, I think it's important. I mean, the thing that I think we've done pretty well over, you know, a decade or more, certainly even preceding me is, we, we don't rush into things a whole lot. We, we try not to react. We try to be strategic and, um, you know, we, we try not to say, ah, oh, we've lost three or four games. And so now we have to do something, you know, it's, it's much more aimed at how we can grow this thing steadily over time. And I think that's, what's allowed us to play in four or five finals. And when you have this dynamic now too, of trying to keep a championship team at the top, 
and you have three flat salary cap years in a row because of COVID last year, this year, next year, you have to be very strategic about the investments you make. And within that context, then the fact that this player will only take a $200,000 cap hit, it became a no brainer in terms of roster building that this was the kind of player we wanted to target. Um, and so then we said, and we, you know, you know, this, the, the contract is for three and a half years with an option. So it's very much a long-term thing. It's a player that we think is going to grow and develop and we can build around. Um, and so that then became the focus uh, of our search. Um, and and Benize was one of those where um, we were toying around with, we looked at a couple of acquisitions within the league. Um, we thought about selling on an international spot. Uh, and ultimately we thought, you know, hey, you know, we might have a chance this year again. Um, and if we do, a guy like Benize is going to be real handy to have. I mean, the, conge- the fixture congestion really hasn't started yet. I mean, it, it really gets daunting now, s- starting literally our next set of games. So I think we play every, I think we only have like two midweeks off for the next three months. I, I know we play, we finished with either 12 or 13 games in the last two months. So it's just, it, we're back to like a COVID pace, like we were at, at in 2020. And so we are going to need a lot of players um, in order to get to navigate that and get through that. Uh, Garth, the, the market has changed so much and MLS really gets taxed in ways that, you know, I've never seen in the time covering the league, uh, both in, in the amount of money of transfer fees, but also this um, keeping the players percentage uh, um, of a future sale. Um, and according to my sources, it seems like that's that was a big point of negotiations across the board in MLS. Uh, was there a percentage or can you share any of that information in terms of uh, Leo's signing? Yeah, yeah, we bought 80%. Um, and so for those who are unfamiliar with that convention, um, it, it is not uncommon, particularly in Latin America. Well, to be fair, all over the world, it's not uncommon. Uh, you know, the Sounders did it with uh, DeAndre Yedlin when, when Tottenham. Uh, bought him, they, they maintained a, a percentage of his economic rights. Um, and so Gremio in this case keeps 20% of uh, Leo Chu's uh, economic rights. And that means that if we sell him, um, then they participate uh, in the profits of that sale. So um, it's part of the, just part of normal, pretty normal part of the global marketplace. And as MLS moves forward, um, I think we said, we think the Busio sale was, was went public today and that was a pretty big one. Another big step forward for the league um, just as a participant in the global marketplace. And, you know, Nico COVID has, has shut down the marketplace for the most part. Um, and, but what's, what that's done for us in MLS um, because we're pretty stable and we have, you know, really deep financial backing because of the fan support here in, in uh, Seattle and, and, you know, through the, uh, the standing of our ownership group. Uh, you know, we're, we're some of the few clubs in the world that are able to buy players right now. And I do think we got uh, pretty good values uh, for what we went down there and went shopping with. And it's particularly in a marketplace where, uh, you know, it's historically been too expensive for MLS. And we're now we're now getting into Brazil and opening it up. And, um, you know, obviously with JP, we, we uh, uh, you know, JP's absolutely hit it out of the park. And for me, uh, you know, one of the best players on the team this year. So we're excited to have another Brazilian. Hey, Garth, just keeping this very open-ended here, how did COVID affect the scouting, the negotiations, and the eventual uh, signing here of, uh, of of Leo? Well, I would, I mean, and again, this is probably uh, just trite at this point, but, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't imagine I've ever signed a player before, we've ever signed a player before that we'd never seen play live um, and that we hadn't met in person, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we get we we were heavy heavily video reliant, heavy heavy data analytics reliant, um, and again, fortunately, uh, you know, between Sean Henderson and Robbie Romanini, and again under the leadership of, of Craig Weibel, who's come in to take over our our player development and player identification, um, you know, have a great deal of confidence in those guys and the decisions they make and the recommendations they make, and um, you know, there were a very limited number of players that they had a high degree of comfort with, but this this was one of them. Um, and, you know, and as we discussed, Jackson, we, we tried really hard not to fixate on any one target. 
uh, and that allows us hopefully then to find good values within the marketplace, within that, that universe or that, that, that's not a universe by any means, it's within that small group of players that, that Weibel and Sean and Robbie uh, can agree upon and, and say, hey, this is our recommendation, this is our group, let's go get one of these guys. With that, is, is uh, Leo uh, vaccinated? Um, and then I, I missed the beginning part of what you were talking about. So I mean, is he going to have to quarantine? Is that why he's coming in late? Or? He's, he's got to get a visa, uh, Jada, to be able to work in the United States. So that takes a couple of weeks. Um, there are some issues with traveling from Brazil. So just all, all the U.S. government stuff, it'll take a couple of weeks uh, to sort through all that stuff. Um, certainly, uh, if, if he is not vaccinated, we would want him to be vaccinated. I believe that he is. I don't know that we have gotten proof of that yet, so I'll, I'll hedge my bets a little bit. But um, you know, we're a hundred percent vaccinated team. Um, that's something that's really important to us. I think that's a really important value um, in our community in particular. So uh, please go out and get vaccinated if you haven't already. Um, it protects everybody, um, and, and certainly we would uh, expect the same of our players uh, to look out for each other. Hey Garth, uh, in the release, it mentioned that uh, part of Benazay's salary is being picked up by uh, the Rapids. I'm just curious if you can um, expand on that and, and add any detail that might that you're sure. To sure. The, the, the TAM guys, like the, the convention on TAM guys, is you can buy them down to 150. Um, and I, I don't. This is minutia within minutia, Jeremiah. So this is maybe an audience of one, but uh, you know, I yeah, assure you, not, more than me. Okay. <laughs> Um, DTAM, you can use DTAM, the discretionary TAM or GAM to buy down a TAM player. The lowest you can buy them down to is 150. When you trade a player, then it's that traded cat value that gets moved. So we would take the 150 to which he's bought. It would be the same. To be clear, there's no, like, we pulled one over on Colorado here. We, we buy our TAM guys down to 150 as well. So we're, were we to trade one of our TAM guys, then the other team would be the beneficiary of it going the other way. Um, but, but yes, we, we take 150 of Benazé, we paid the Rapids 50. Um, so, you know, we, we, we spent 400,000 in cap space altogether, 200 for the YPS and, uh, 200 all in for Benazé. And, 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 uh, if we resign Benazé next year, we pay 50 K more to the Rapids, um, which seemed equitable, uh, to everybody. So, um, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's still a pretty, you know, chess move, you know, brilliant. I mean, it's pr pretty good move, if, if you ask me. Uh, another good move, it, it, and the one that maybe, uh, as I hear from South American players, they don't really like to do is uh, locking in a player for a long time. It seems like in the negotiations, a good point of emphasis was uh, that uh, you guys wanted to uh, sign Leo to four year contract. Uh, you guys do that. How important is that for you guys to have him in a four year contract and an option uh, that could put him at five? Yeah, it's super important, Nico. I mean, we're making big investments, right? I mean, this is, you know, we're spending $2.5 million on the player. So, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, when you spread that out over three or four years, particularly a kid that you say we think we think is going to develop and get better. And so his, his performance level is going to improve as we go. Um, I think when you're looking at that, you really want to look at that investment and say, you know, if you're amortizing that over four years, that looks a lot better than amortizing over two. And moreover, uh, if you want to be a participant in the transfer market, then it really benefits you to have a longer contract because you want to, you know, you want Leo to be able to play here for some period of time. Um, and then, you know, if he, if he chooses to go, if we choose to sell him, you know, then to have a contract in place already where, then somebody has to pay a transfer fee for him and, and uh, he wouldn't leave us for free after we paid, uh, paid what we paid. So I think as an investment point, yes, young players on longer contracts, um, I think is a good idea. Now, now look, we're, we're going to miss on some, right? We, we said this, younger players carry more risk. They're less proven. Um, and, you know, if, if we, you know, there may come a day when we need to sell a young player at a loss at some point, but hopefully our arbitrage overall will be uh, to the benefit of the club. And, you know, this is a space where, you know, we endeavor to uh, potentially break even at least or um, make some money over time as well. Um, although to be clear, our priority is always going to be winning championships and, and this move and the Benese move are made with the idea that we have a good, we have a really good team. We've added pace that we didn't have and we added another veteran piece 
I think from a guy who's played in the final, played in the French first division, and uh, you know, we think, you know, bolstered our, ourselves for another stretch run. Matthew mentioned the um, process and this being the first time that you haven't that anybody nobody has seen the player live. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, is it more sweaty palms? I mean, are you kind of? I mean, it's a lot of money to spend. So, are you kind of like, yikes? Let's see what happens here. Or what was that? Those huddles like with with y'all? Well, let me caveat this before Sean Henderson kills me because it, you know we track these guys usually for years at a time. It, it only gets to me usually when it gets to the you know are we going to sign them level. So Sean might have seen them. It just might have been before the pandemic. Um, but uh, that said, uh, it, it, it was different, Jade. You just it like like COVID has affected everything. You just you have to adjust and you have to look at it a different way and you have to take all the information you can get, the physical data, the video video. Uh, study and you know you got to trust your relationships on the ground in brazil as well um and and the talent evaluators um that we work with down there and uh, you know this is a, a bright up and coming young player um and he's had a little bit of a, a rough patch here in the in the in the last little bit and you know again that created what we thought was a, a value um but we'll get him in here and we'll we'll see if that was correct or not and and i you know i do think that for somebody who doesn't speak English and who hasn't traveled extensively outside of Brazil and it's going to be in a new city and as a younger person, like I do think there's going to be some adjustment there and he's going to be joining the team in mid season. So I think, I think we definitely want to be patient. Um, but I do think that, that Leo has a, a ton of potential um, if we're willing to be patient. Uh, when do you think uh, Benazay will be uh, ready to join the team? Obviously he's already in the league. And when you, you talk about getting your, uh, you know, your, your starters who are injured back, what does that do to some of the younger players who have started to emerge? Uh, obviously, they're going to have to be fighting for what minutes are left when you guys are kind of at full strength and obviously potentially going down to defiance. Yeah, look, I mean, when I talk about those, those veterans, Shane and Madranda and Roe and Montero, you know, uh, and Bruin, you know, as, as examples, right? They're going to be in battles, man. They're going to be in battles with Atencio and Leva and A.B. Sissoko and, um, you know, some of the other kids that are up and coming, the Reeds, the Ethans, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that's what it comes down to, Mickey. We, we want, you know, in the front office, we want to give the coaches some difficult decisions to make. Um, I, you know, I don't expect us to abandon our, our young players now, um, you know, but not through any, you know, choice. I mean, we wouldn't make that choice. Just as I said it earlier in the call, you know, I think, uh, you know, in, in particular, Danny, Josh, and AB, I think are regarded now as players. And they're going to compete for spots and compete for time. And, um, you know, those are those are guys that we're going to look to to play minutes because we're going to play every four days for the next three months, basically. So, um, you know, that's part of it. And to the specific Benazé question, um, he, I believe, is going to be available not for Tigres, but for the game uh thereafter is, is our hope he's got to get his stuff and move from colorado and transition and there's some there's some things to take care of there but uh you know hopefully uh he's ready to go uh, a week or so from now guys any any other questions for garth and if there are that's fine i'm sure he'll be happy to spend another minute or two but just checking in Garth, uh, you said at the very start um, that we're in the great game now. Was that directly a Game of Thrones reference? Absolutely. Come on, Jackson. Good. I'm on your show every week. Just, just making sure. Just making sure. Caulfield <laughs> challenged me to see if I could get a Transformers reference in here, and I couldn't come up with anything off the cuff. So <laughs> I, went, <clears throat> went, I went Game of Thrones mixed with Wizard of Oz, and I probably well, bungled I, it. But. I, I stopped counting after five pop culture references. I was getting tired, so... Uh, <laughs> My, my wife just says I'm a loser. So like, that's just to keep it just real clean and simple, but uh, you know, I do the best I can. Do you, do you feel like the club is inevitable in the Western conference at this point? You know what? I, I love the Thanos there. Um, the, you know, I, I don't, I can't say that. Right. I mean, Kansas City's yeah. came into, came into our house and punched us in the mouth and um, you know, that wasn't our full team by any stretch. And we'd love another crack at them, but. But no, man, there's this, it's MLS, it's tight. It, you know, there, there are a bunch of good teams and, uh, you know, we all say we're going to get healthy. Like it's like, that's inevitable. And it's not, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta get healthy and stay healthy. Um, you know, and that was one of the things, you know, with Nico, like Nico was out a long time. Um, but at least last year after he was out for a while, like we got him back and he was able to stay back. So 
I think our, our medical staff, our performance staff has done a nice job uh, managing some of these rehabs, uh, especially some of the lengthier ones to, to get these guys back in a sustainable manner and at least adding to our aura of inevitability, Jackson, if you will. You know, Garth, uh, that is a great line and I, and I loved it, but what exactly do you, do you mean by that? The great game? Is that the, the game of, of spending lots of money on, on young players or what's the, what, like, when you say that, what is it that you, you mean? We're joining the rest of the world, Jeremiah, you know, but the, the, you know, moving players, buying and selling players is part of being in global soccer and the, the need, the necessity to develop young players is part of being in global soccer. And, you know, for a long time, I think MLS existed apart from uh, the rest of the world. Um, and that's, that's, that, that is inevitably changing. That is, you know, the, the, the world is pulling us in. And to be fair now, I think in the last couple of years, even in the last two years, we've really flipped to really embrace that, right? And we had tried to lay some groundwork for that here when we started the youth program, when we started uh, what was then S2, now Defiance. Um, and I think we've gotten a little bit better every year. Uh, and so I, I do think we're prepared for that great game. But, but what I would, I mean what I say, I don't think there's any turning back. We're in the great game now. We, this is the way forward for the club. This is a sustainable path to success. Um, this is the sustainable way um, to maintain championship teams year after year after year after year. Um, and, you know, we need to make key strategic investments along the way in players like Leo Chu uh, to help facilitate that. Um, Garth, I gotta, this might be a rookie question here, but with Leo Chu's, uh, the bow and arrow, and then also with the Jamaican flag, is there, is that a Usain Bolt thing, or do you know what's, uh, what the significance are of those things with him? I, I do not know, Jada. Uh, that's a wonderful question to ask him. I think it might have to do with his nickname, Jada, but I'll, I'll circle up at the after the call just to make sure I've got all my facts straight from what we've seen online. What, what is his nickname? Do you, I believe okay. it is Flecha Negra is what I've seen, but uh, others have not seen anything different. I'll defer to my esteemed colleagues, but I'll call you after and we can talk. That's through. fine. Okay, thanks. Other questions, guys? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to touch up a little bit on what you said. I, I guess, how important is it for MLS in general to uh, become that stepping stone to other teams into Europe, right? I mean, that's a conversation that's had often with uh, players coming from South America that uh, a lot of people believe they're just gonna come and just stay in MLS and uh, they're not gonna continue their trajectory, you know, in, in Europe or other leagues. So how important is it for the league with this new initiative in general to begin putting players from MLS play a couple of years and then put them out in bigger leagues. Look, I, I think that's what's going to happen. You're seeing it happen already, Nico. You know, when you look at the players that have been sold uh, in the last two, three windows, um, MLS is that platform. Uh, it is the, the league now that more and more people around the world are starting to watch and pay attention to and um, are going to move place to Europe. But the other thing I'd say, man, is as MLS grows and we host the World Cup here in 2026 between Mexico, U.S. and Canada, uh, MLS's potential is still through the roof. And, you know, we, we may be a platform to Europe right now, but the aspiration is to, is to be able to put ourselves and right, rise ourselves, raise ourselves, raise ourselves, if that's English, uh, to that level, you know, to, to try to compete with the best leagues in the world over time. And the way we do that is by developing players and, uh, and, and signing young players from other countries. And, um, in some cases, moving them on, and in some cases, retaining them, and it'll it'll be a case by case basis. But but it, that you know, it's a game we have to be in. We we can't ignore that. We can't not do that. We can't not develop our young players as assets um, and understand the value they have in the global marketplace. So, um, you know that that's that's the exciting part I think of what's happened this year. But, you know, three young players establishing themselves within the team. Um, youngest team to win a game. You know, we've lost three of three of three, four and one or whatever. Sorry, three, one, three and one, maybe in the last five, something like that. We have, we've had a little bit of a rough patch, but the game we won was when we played all our kids. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's exciting. And look, it took a wonder goal from a veteran like Raul and take nothing away from that. You know, you, you know, the, the kids don't make it without Yamar and JP and Raul. 
um, and Steph Cleveland doing a steady job in the back. Um, but uh, you got to be able to do both now. You got to be able to sign the veteran guys like we've done, and you got to be able to sign and develop uh, the young players and integrate them uh, into part of your, your team and your system. I'll ask one uh, quick one, uh, kind of based off of that. Uh, you guys have sent out a couple of the young players on loan, uh, Alfonso a couple of Chavez um, uh, among those. And uh, obviously Trey Muse has been on the loan. Uh, do you expect that uh, kind of thing to accelerate here in the next couple of years, especially given the increase in the amount of young players who are making it up to the first team? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and we're, I'm glad you asked about that, Mickey, because we're really excited about that excuse me, that loan situation for Alfonso Campbell Chavez and also uh, Soda from Defiance. That was all Weibel. Um, Weibel uh, put Pablo Ruiz and Andrew Brody uh, from, from RSL into that same club. And, the, and the, the key to the whole thing is Christian Ziga, who's a former German international player. And, and he, for, you know, for personal reasons, is the coach of that tiny little club uh, in the third division in Austria. Um, but he's able to really uh, mentor those kids. And, and when Pablo Ruiz and, and Andrew Brody came back, they became starters for, for RSL. Uh, and so what we are hoping is that a similar process can go on with, with Bonds and with uh, Soda, um, such that we really accelerate their uh, development path. Uh, and we're excited about that opportunity for them. It's, it's, it's really like, it's, it's literally up in the mountains in the Alps, and, and there is nothing there other than a village and soccer balls. So, you know, it is, it's, you know, soccer, total immersion, um, you know, 24 seven. And, you know, it's just a great way to kind of, for those kids to kind of hone their craft a little bit and, and, uh, and really figure out uh, what it takes to be successful as a pro. Uh, Garth, has there been any update or new conversations between uh, you guys in Atlanta about the Gonzalo Pineda interview, uh, permission or, or when they might happen anything like that I, I don't know the, the when and the how but yes we've given atlanta permission to interview gonzalo um he, he is very deserving of that i think he's one of the best young assistants in the in the league um he's done a great job for us uh he does incredible work you know he is our primary tactician um so uh the architect behind uh the system that we rolled out earlier this year and, the, and that some of the tweaks you've seen in game so uh, he, he, he's done a lot for us and uh, we're really excited anytime our, our staff get, per, get uh, promotions uh, or get opportunities. And uh, we're really excited for uh, Gonzo and, and look, he'll, he'll speak to Atlanta and they'll make their decision and he'll make his. And uh, if he stays with us, we'll, we'll be really happy with that. And, and if he goes, we'll be really happy for him. Uh, just, just as we were with, uh, with Chris Henderson and, uh, you know, uh, Mark Nichols and Chris Little, you know, as just as three examples that have gone on to, the bigger and better things uh, in the last uh, last within the last two years uh, from the staff. So, all right, guys. Any other questions for Garth? Okay, Garth. Thank you for joining us. We know it's been a busy twenty four hours and indeed a busy week as well. So, take a nap. I'm going to do that, but not until we watch the Fiance play. We got a, we got a like one of the youngest midfields I think we ever put out there. I'm so excited, man. This, this, these young guys are so fun, man. They, they have so much energy, and you know every game you go out and you get to learn something. Um, you know I've seen enough MLS games after 14 years. I kind of know how some of them are going to play out, but it's really fun to watch the Fiance. So I hope you guys get a chance to uh, to watch the Fiance, and, and uh, I'll end just on a little shout out shout out to John Hutchinson, um, who's doing great over at Yokohama in Japan. Uh, and uh, again, was a guy who was instrumental in, in uh, both as the coach of Defiance, but also in the development role of the first team last year. None of you guys got to see him or talk to him, um, but he did a great job uh, with Josh Atencio, Danny Leva, some others, and Henry Brauner has really uh, picked up the reins and done an awesome job for us with these kids uh, going forward, and is going to have even more work uh, to do now that we have uh, Leo Chu in the fold and uh, be working with the assistant coaches to, to uh, really spend a lot of time with these kids. So we're excited.